I have a, a fairly silly question, uh, but it leads into a more serious one, so I just have to give you a heads up. Uh, Robert, um, is Starbug an electric vehicle? <laughs> I, I have to ask, but seriously, uh, what do you, uh, all four of you, think the future of space travel would be? Um, is, is it electric, or are we going to go for more hydropower? Um, or, yeah. I've always really loved the idea of the, 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 using nuclear weapons to power vehicles through space. I just thought, when I first saw that, I thought that's a, it's like a red dwarf joke. It was very, very seriously considered that you eject a nuclear weapon out the back of a spaceship with a really strong shield, and then you blow it up, and the explosion forces the, 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 uh, you know, the shock wave, drives the, and, if you, and you keep doing it. You go boom, boom, so you're leaving a trail of nuclear disasters everywhere you go. <laughs> Fantastic idea. I have literally no clue. I mean, I know that an I, I understand enough about physics that if you had an electric motor spinning a fan and you're in a vacuum, it's not going to do a lot. It'll spin really fast, <laughs> but it probably won't drive you along. So I don't know. There's a whole world of very interesting technology there. I think we've got... I've, personally feel we have so many issues to deal with on, the, on a, a little distance above the planet's surface that I hope you go into space. <laughs> yeah, I, I had, I've had lunch with a, a woman who spent four days on the space shuttle who was a, 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 sci a doctor who was studying bone density and she vomited every hour for four days and uh, <laughs> was very grateful to get back to Earth, but not everyone does. But she was, I thought she was very generous to offer that to us all. And that when you vomit in the bag, I must stop, but it was such a good story. They have special bags with special snappy shut, and it shuts immediately after you vomit, but there's always a bit that floats off. And then it hits the, it hits the fans that are dry, that keep, and then it's, it sounded grim as I just couldn't, I was so happy I'd never been in one. So, yeah, I think space travel is probably slightly outside our remit. But it's very good, and I have no idea what makes it. Some two little wires and a puppeteer make Starbug go along. I don't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know what Starbug is, just Google it after the... Uh, yeah. um, is there any other... The young woman sitting here. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. How do you think aeroplanes will change in the future? Oh, I'm so excited. Can I... You, you'll know, you know, because you'll be doing stuff with aeroplanes. They will change. Well, that's what I'm saying. But, well, well, aeroplanes are interesting, right? It wasn't so long ago that we had the great innovation of the Concorde, travelling at magnificent, neck-breaking speeds, and that's gone. You know, that that that's technology gone back. So, so, what happened there? Similarly, we've got these huge. Is it the A380s? The yeah. huge, huge, yeah, and, and equally, that the market isn't taking up those huge planes for a variety of different reasons. And so it comes back down to sort of user need, and I think it comes down to market need as well. What are the future of aeroplanes going to look like? But from a technology level, I just think travel in the sky is going to change beyond recognition, and an interim to that is going to be some of those flying electric vertical takeoff and landing personal mobility solutions that we were considering earlier. The, the, uh, just to, the only thing I know about it is uh, Norway, the Norwegian government is, is uh, applying enormous pressure to their local uh, aeronautical industry. They want to only have electric aircraft, that, and this is winged aeroplanes with passengers, as opposed to you know, flying drones, um, uh, by uh, very soon. I mean, 2025 they're talking about, and they, have, they were testing 2040. In Norway, is it? Yeah. Okay, 2040. I'm never, never good at numbers. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, unfortunately, one of them crashed in a field a couple of weeks ago, didn't it? Which is a, a test one. It had to, it had to, it, something went wrong. So it's still very early technology, but we've seen there are electric aircraft now. I've been up in an electric glider, which was quite challenging. Uh, so that it goes up in the air with an electric motor and then it glides down. You know, that, that already exists. There are electric training planes, but Rolls Royce are doing an enormous amount of work with electric propulsion in the air. We've seen an experimental contra-rotating propeller system with two electric motors driving propellers in opposite directions. 
which was so exciting for us because, you know, all the thing about electric vehicles, they're quieter. This really wasn't quiet. <laughs> this was unbelievably noisy. But uh, if you have two propellers spinning around at 10,000 RPM, what happens at the tips of the, as they go past each other is quite loud. So that was very exciting. An enormous amount of thrust and force if you put that in a cow, in a um, whatever those tubes are that you have on aeroplanes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, ducting, 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 thank you. I mean, to your question, I'm also quite interested to know whether passenger planes will ever be fully autonomous. Obviously, there's autopilot yeah. mm. as you're flying, but what about takeoff and landing? Is that something that the computer can achieve? Well, it does today. It does already, yeah. The A380 yeah. generally lands yes. completely without any human intervention. So do, do we need a pilot? Um, certainly, if you don't drive regularly, you will become de-skilled. And the pilots, as, you, as you've quite rightly said, pilots who don't fly the aircraft themselves, they do tend to de-skill, and the airlines take a lot of effort to make sure that they are still able to take over the aircraft. They are still competent to fly. The airlines can afford to do that. They're big organisations. The reality is that car drivers, if they get de-skilled, they will get de-skilled, and they will not be able to do it. And I think the reality of it is that we will, will not have the sort of level three. You, you talked about level five. For those of you who are not aware, there are different levels that are recognised of autonomy on vehicles. So level one is no autonomy. Level two is a bit of assistance. Level three is where the vehicle can drive itself, but it needs somebody looking over its shoulder. So is, is Tesla's autopilot, would you call that level three, just as a matter of interest? Le it, People try and use it as a level three, but strictly speaking, it's level two. Right, I would think. Tesla I would say, say you should right. keep your hands on the steering yeah. wheel, so it's only an assistance system. Level four is where life gets much more interesting because that's where the vehicle can take control or has full control for all of the time. But level four is constrained, so it's not it can't go everywhere. Level five is the perfect utopia of it can do anything. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, level five I don't think will ever will ever yeah. exist anyway. Because we don't even have level five humans. <laughs> I mean, I'm close. I'm pretty close. Yeah. There, 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 are, there are some very good drivers, but a, a, a driver like Lewis Hamilton, who's, who's a, got fantastic reactions, I don't know if he's any good at driving on snow or through a sandstorm or through a Ford. Yeah, you you no. leave that to Valfrey Bottas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, this is the point. There, there aren't any level five humans, or there are very, very few. We don't need them. We're all level four humans, that's fine. Level three is the dodgy one because going back to your point about de-skilling, if you're there to monitor the vehicle and the vehicle gets into trouble and you've kind of drifted away, you've fallen asleep or whatever, the vehicle's got to actually make sure that you're still awake, that you know what's going on. And I, that's why I don't think there will be a level three. I think we'll jump straight from two to four. On, on the de-skilling point, I think there are a lot of lessons potentially that can be learned from other industries of what happens when you are moving away from, from a process that someone's in charge of to one where they're kind of supervising it. Um, so I think, I think there's probably lessons from other industries um, that might be really helpful in trying to think about what you could do to try and mitigate some of the some of the risks. And, and obviously the thing that strikes me listening to this is just that challenge of... Um, understanding public views about some of these issues, particularly around kind of autonomous planes mm -hmm. and electric planes and making sure that, that you, um, you really understand what, what those concerns are and that you can really think about how to mitigate those. So, so uh, two points really. One is a sort of, I think, I'd like the panel to touch on the systemic changes that are needed. As a frustrated Tesla driver of nearly four years, I can tell you that the uh, way people drive does not cater to vehicles, and I think Tesla is three. It just reminds you to keep your hand on the wheel because of the uh, sort of issues legally in terms of driving on your own or not. But the issue is you put the car on uh, autopilot or autonomous driving and you leave a safe distance of four cars on the motorway or five. And there's someone who'll come in because <laughs> they've got so much space. Or if you're driving in London, you leave a car distance of two everybody's in there. So it's impossible. And actually, these vehicles are far safer. And really what is needed is an ethic of driving or, or changes in terms of rules that there are to encourage and have these cars use their full potential. 
and that is one. And the other thing is really a comment on de-skilling and really simulation is the answer. That's how pilots do it. We can all do it. We just need to put those goggles on. <laughs> I don't think I've got an answer for that because I, I know exactly what you're talking about. But uh, yes. First one, we need assistance. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think we're going through an experience at the moment where how where we're experiencing how difficult it is to agree on a system as human beings, and I think that's not a new issue. I think it's been going on a long time. But I, yeah, people should be more polite, and it is definitely a problem when a machine. I mean, I think this goes back to what you you uh, what you were saying. I was in, in that a machine does this perfectly. Mm. If you're in a Tesla and yeah. you've got a five car distance between you and the car in front, the Tesla will never hit that car. That car jams its brakes on, the Tesla puts its brakes on before <coughs> you even notice. But <laughs> someone's going to pull in yeah. or someone's yeah. going to pull in. And uh, I mean, that happens constantly every five minutes. You're on a motorway and, and you know, someone will always cut in and truck because there's a gap. They go, well, there's a gap. I'll get in there. You no, know, that's very much human nature, and the, the car doesn't know it. The car then slows down more to give you a five-car gap between well, it. Well, it might react and stop the car in the same way that a human might suddenly take hold of the steering wheel and stop. Put but, the brake on. But, yeah, well, yeah. But, but how, you know, how does a car determine if it has a choice between two things to hit, a dog and a person? How does it, how does it apply that human element to decide, and it's got no option, has to hit one, what does it do? I mean, I don't know the answer. I'm uh, the dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it depends. But I mean, yeah. if it's that, I think the yeah. other thing is, because uh, I've heard these discussions, I, I don't want to get too bogged down in autonomous vehicle, the, tra the, the tram, the points, the, the, and you kill the ten people the of the one person. Problem. The trolley problem. The trolley problem. But, uh, you know, the, the one autonomous car that I went in in Las, Las Vegas, that, that uh, was interesting was that, that it, it was aware of other vehicles that I, as a human being, could not see. It knew how fast they were going, what direction they were going, and where they were going. And it, because then we were on an empty road, and the car braked quite violently all of a sudden. It was set up, to, to be fair, and a man in a Prius drove across a, a cross street that we couldn't see. It was behind a building, so we had no idea it was there. And the look of fear on that man's face, because that was his job all day, was to drive out in front of a, <laughs> an autonomous... He was like that, because he, would, he couldn't see us, but he was told, you drive at 40 mph, straight across, <laughs> do not stop! You know, and, and, and it was impressive from that point of view, but the, the, the amount of sensors in the, the Nissan Leaf that I drove, it could see every... It could see a child 500 metres ahead on the sidewalk, on a, on a bike, going wobbly, wobbly, and it had a little square around it. I couldn't even see it. I had to go, well, there's a kid. Oh, yeah, there is one. Yeah. I mean, in, so they're w potentially way better than any human mm, being. You know, that, and you're yeah. talking, then you're talking level yeah. five. If you, were, if you did achieve a level five autonomous car, we can be totally de-skilled. We can just do pottery, weaving, <laughs> poetry. We don't need to worry about how we drive, because we won't, because we're... Let's be honest, human beings are rubbish at driving. How many people die every year in cars now? It is a shocking, terrible legacy, apart from being choked to death by diesel, just by being hit by cars, by rubbish drivers that aren't concentrating and are texting. I saw a woman doing it today in the traffic as I was walking along. Uh, I mean, for God's sake, you know, we are rubbish. If we had a, an autonomous car that was texting, I'd love that. <laughs> what was the car doing when it crashed there? Ah, it was texting. It's having a row with a Mercedes. <laughs> uh, we should get to a question that's not about... I can't choose. You choose. You pick. OK, there's the, the guy on the end of the aisle. Thank you. Um, with the move to uh, autonomous, say, ride-hailing services uh, in the near future, do you think there might be a social problem with how people treat the vehicles? Because we've seen with the likes of uh, ride uh, scooters, electric scooters... A lot of them are disregarded on the streets, and the actual sort of economic uh, profitability of the company is questionable. Yes, um, I, I think the way that people treat autonomous vehicles is is, is going to be a major issue. Um, we've already seen yeah. on the on the Heathrow pods, bearing in mind that Heathrow pods are there for business class passengers, and you'd expect them to be relatively decent relatively sensible people. <laughs> and the number of them they get urinated in is just oh, you're atrocious. Kidding. <laughs> oh, I've been in one. I didn't know that. Yeah. Should have taken a wet wipe. It, so, so, yeah, there is a problem with this. 
that mm. people have got to respect the, 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 mm. the, the other people's property. You wouldn't do that if there's a driver in there. Or at least I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the one aspect that it won't be, because I've been in a few cities around the world that have, you know, like the rented scooters and they are just left all over the pavement and all that sort of stuff. But I think that is probably one thing that won't happen with, you know, a fully autonomous uh, taxi, say. Because, you know, you'll get out of it and you'll go, I've just left it on the street. Well, it will drive off and go somewhere else. So yes. that's not really, that's not, you know, you're not going to see yep. clusters of discarded taxis outside an office block. I mean, they'll go somewhere else. But it's quite a key issue in terms of some of the, the sort of more, the more intermediate solutions. So things like car clubs. I mean, th that is potentially an issue. And that it's about people's sense of ownership. It's not theirs. Mm. So they don't yeah. really care. Yeah. And so there it's about really understanding how people use them, what their motivations are, how, what you can do to try and kind of cut through that sort of less ideal behaviour and try and avoid it happening in the first I mean, place. I, I, I don't know if it's a peculiarly uh, uh, habit of, of the British Isles, as I like to refer to them, but that, that when we went, we did a programme about uh, a company called Car2Go in Berlin. They've got about eight now, 9,000 cars on the streets of Berlin that you get in with a you use your driving license you drive it to where you want to go mm. you get out and leave it and park it and you go away and do whatever you're doing and a very popular service and every single car we got in was immaculately clean it feel like it had just yeah. been valeted it smelt mm. nice but it had been used every day by they get used a huge amount of uh, times and the cameraman I was with he said if this, if this is in London or Manchester this would be full of fish and chip wrappers <laughs> Some other used items I'm not going to go into, he just did. And, you know, beer cans and rubbish everywhere, which I, don't, I actually don't necessarily think that's true, but it was, uh, it was funny. I mean, it's... Well, exactly, they know when you're in it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But the key, so the key there is being yeah. able to link it back to, to a person. Who, who was in and it. that's yeah. the challenge with bikes and scooters. Mm. Yes. Is that, yes. Yeah. There's your answer. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although I think they did know, because I've got their app, and, I, and I, was, I was so thrilled at my age to go up to a scooter for the first time and go, like that, and it went, tick, and unlocked itself. And I got on it, and I was like, I did that on mine. No young people helped me at any stage of that process. <laughs> I was really thrilled. So it shows, that's a good bit of software. That worked, yeah. Uh, gosh, it's good. Well, let's, this, this, the young lady here, is, uh, who did, she had her hand up earlier on, in the middle in the white top. You touched on the advantages of compartmental, compartmental taxis, but what do you think of the waiting times between stops, and how would you prioritise who gets dropped off first? Mm. Ah, Ooh, good. Well, good one. I didn't think of that. That's good. Yeah. The, <laughs> the honest answer is I don't know, but I know that <laughs> uh, there's a chap called Uber who's got a, a very good technique for yeah. doing that. Um, th there are ways in which you can calculate which are the optimum routes, and you can, I, I suppose, I don't know whether, I've never used to do Uber, to be honest, I don't know, but I, my guessing is that it would be fairly straightforward to say, I want to be a priority person, and I'm going to pay a bit more. Or, oh, I'm willing to take a bit, more, bit longer and I'll pay a bit less. So I, I think there's, there's, there are options, and I'm sure we'll see different services providing different options for different, uh, different people. What I'd love in that one is when you get to your destination, it warns you. It doesn't just do this out of the blue. It warns you on your screen in your little compartment. Okay, your stop has come up. You'll, you'll get there in 20 seconds, 19. It counts you down. And then when it stops, the door opens incredibly fast. And the chair goes out of the thing and turns. It just goes flat. And it doesn't eject you, but it just makes you stand up. And you're, you're suddenly standing up. And it goes whap, back in and off it goes. And you get out of the vehicle in like 0.4 of a second. Because what would help gentlemen of a certain age might know that sometimes it takes you longer to get up, you know. I want something that goes, Kung! and just throws me up. You know. <laughs> it can be keep done. you fit, and then you'd run off. It can be done. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, that was very cheap. A young person. Very good, a young person. Um, how do you think people's perspective will change on uh, diesel cars and things like that? On diesel cars? Yes. And fuel cars, yeah. I, and I, I think it's really changing, particularly after Dieselgate. Um, mm. Mindsets are shifting. It wasn't so long ago, though, that we thought diesel gar cars were well, all great. right, actually. Yeah. We thought we could travel a farther distance on them, and we weren't really thinking that diesel cars were awful, and then Dieselgate happened, and then lots of other things happened, and we think, oh, my goodness. 
And I think with electric vehicles, as soon as people start driving them, it's a completely different driving experience. What I've heard some people say before is it, it, it's, like, it's like giving up smoking and not wanting to go back, right? The dif difference between diesel cars and electric cars. So I think it's a, it's, it's a brilliant question, and I think attitudes are in the process of changing right now. I think it's, uh, I had such an, uh, it such an obvious thing as soon as it happened, but it still took me by surprise. My daughter learnt to drive in an electric car. So she'd only ever driven electric cars. She drove on Nissan Leaf. That's what she learnt to drive in. She drive with me with the L plates on, and she was, you know, she was very competent. And then she had to have lessons to get her license, and she had to have lessons in a manual car. And her report back of the manual car was, I think, a prediction of the future. Because mm. she said, there's a stick. <laughs> and you've got to, and it's got three pedals, and you've got to press one. That, how? Did you used to do that? And I went, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so rubbish. She used a lot. My daughter's a bit older than you, and she's got an Australian mother. It's not her fault. <laughs> Don't blame my daughter, but some inappropriate language, which I won't repeat. But her description of a, of a manual uh, internal combustion engine car, and it makes so much noise, and it's so hot. Those are the things. There's this great hot thing in the front that's beep, beep, beeping a noise. Uh, so it was a really fascinating thing to see someone who never, really consciously, never, she never, she'd never driven anything else, but also by that stage she hadn't known uh, uh, other than electric cars as, the, as her main form of... That's what Dad picked her up from the school disco in. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, anyway. But uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think, the, I think attitudes have shifted. I think Dieselgate was a really surprising... Uh, it, uh, Dieselgate, without question, has sold more electric cars than any other incident mm. in recent yeah. history. It, it, and, uh, and it transformed. The Volks, Volkswagen, as you may know, launched their first built from the ground up electric vehicle yesterday, the ID3, today. I mean, it's a, it was a very recent news. And they'll only make electric cars by, in the next few years. It won't be, um, you know, they won't make any, they certainly won't make diesels anymore. I think they've kind of learnt their lesson. They've actually just been busted again in Europe, haven't they, for cheating on the cheat. Uh, on the cheat, you know, they didn't stop cheating. They cheated, got caught, said, oh, we fixed it. It's all fine. <coughs> and then they've carried on cheating, which is, so they've had another massive fine. So I think they really have to possibly stop the cheating thing. Other, I mean, and also, it's very unfair on Volkswagen because... They all do it. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> Mercedes vans, don't look at the reports. They're not good. <laughs> you know, diesel vans are just the same. You know, they've used the same mm. technology. Um, let's go for this. I, a lovely old gentleman here. As an engineer, the first question you're asked is safety. And I think we're all happy to fly in aeroplanes because of international air traffic control safety. And it's the same all over the world. So I predict that we're going to need an autonomous car international agency so that every country has got the same software and it's regulated, and then that's got to be paid for. And one of the things with electric vehicles is the government, of course, have lost fuel tax. So yes. are we all going to yes. be paying a tax to the government for every mile we use in any vehicle we use to pay for this sort of thing? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think... I think in, Unless the, our entire tax system changes and we suddenly decide we're going to effectively subsidise transport, then, then yeah, we're going to have to. We're going to have to tax transport in some way. Um, ironically, one of the advantages of the internal combustion engine, sorry, Robert, um, is that basically you pay tax as you go because yeah. cars are all about the same degree of efficiency. Okay, there's a bit of variations, but fundamentally they're all pretty much the same. So if you want to go further... You pay more because you pay more fuel. You pay more fuel tax. And I think if we go to electric vehicles, it actually gets worse because you don't pay very much for your, for your actual energy. It's so much cheaper. All, all the cost is in the vehicle. Mm. It's not in the fuel. So there's no incentive not to use it. See, it makes a lot of sense. If you're going to get an electric vehicle, go and drive it everywhere. Use it for everything. And that's not actually a brilliant idea for... Traffic congestion. Mm. So, uh, and it's certainly not good for tax because you've now got lots of people doing lots and lots of mileage and very little income. So, we're going to have to change something, yes. I mean, I mean, that, that is the policymakers' challenge, though, yeah. isn't it? It's trying to weigh up those different, different elements and whether or not you should change yeah. 
um, whether or not you should change those kind of motivations for people and whether even in an electric car you're still contributing to congestion, you're still producing particulates that affect air quality. Yeah. And maybe that will need to be something that gets taken into account. And, and of course it also gets worse if you have autonomy. So mm. let's say for the sake of argument you've got a two-car family and the, hu the husband drives to work in his car, parks at work, comes home. Wife has a car, she drives to work, comes home. Okay, so we're going to have one car. So we've halved the number of vehicles. Great stuff. So the car is going to take father to work, come back. Mother to work, come back. And suddenly, you've now doubled the number of journeys. The total number of journeys have doubled, even though the number of cars have halved. That is a fairly fundamental consequence. But I mean, that is why, I was, as I was saying right at the beginning, we can't... It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. So if you own a car, you know, people say, oh, I don't want an autonomous car. And I always say, you'll never have one. Don't worry. You know, one might pull up outside your house and you get in it and it takes you somewhere and goes away. But you won't own it. It's a, but, it's but, a ridiculous notion to own an autonomous car. It's a but, crazy but idea. Some, but some people will want to own cars and some people yeah. will be rich enough to be able to do it. Yeah. And to be honest, an autonomous car is going to be a lot cheaper than a flying car. Yes. <laughs> But let's have some, just some. Okay, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to put a little bit of realism into this, I'm sorry. Um, I wanna, we haven't had any questions from that side yet. I'm just going, oh, right, oh, go on, the, the boss, he's allowed. It's a question for Richard. Look, okay. your lovely graph showing the percentage in terms of just, look, this is what you're expecting in terms of proportion of cars. If we work with Alison and we look at um, what is going to be acceptable from society so hence the measures that we put in place regarding incentives can you give us a more aggressive picture of what might happen by 2040 2050 in terms of the proportion of electric vehicles call them autonomous but paint a picture that is rather more bold than the graph that you show but it really means a discussion involving society as to what they want and therefore, what measures and policies would be put in place? Could you let us know how wild your thinking might be? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, the issue that I have is that it's difficult to change things. Um, the roads that we've got are the roads that we've inherited mm. over hundreds of years. I mean, the, the photographs that we saw earlier on, it's the same streets, and they're the same streets today. So fundamentally, the infrastructure hasn't really changed. It's expanded a bit. We've got a few motorways, we've got a few extra house estates. But fundamentally, it's the same. It hasn't changed. And to try and change wholesale all the things that go on it is a massive change. It's risky. And we've got industries which are set up to do stuff, to make cars, to make buses, to make engines. We've got to do a huge swap to change all that. And that's painful. Mm. It's risky. And who's going to put up the money for it? And we think, have to think about who, how to fuel them. Yeah. So, you know, these, our existing infrastructure for that is petrol stations. Exactly. And we mm. now need to build something that's going to work for all yeah. of these different electric vehicles. And, and I think going, going back to the, sort of the, the, the iteration type point, I think we, will, we are going to see a, a revolution in electric vehicles. And the reason for that is because a lot of people can go home and plug it in the wall. Mm. Okay, it's only a 13 amp plug and it'll charge slowly, and it's not very good, but you can do it. You can't do that with hydrogen. There is no hydrogen infrastructure. So fuel cells, I think, are a complete non-starter. I mean, that's probably politically incorrect, but that's my personal opinion. I think battery electric vehicles, yes, fuel cells, no, for that reason. So I think, yeah, I think we will see a lot more electric vehicles. I think they will dominate, and I think there will be vehicles which have wheels which will route going down these 100-year-old streets, because that's what we've got. Um, and I think it's a good point, particularly around infrastructure, and I think it will help when we start thinking about cars as more than mobility solutions. So if we think about electric vehicles as energy storage devices that can interact with the energy infrastructure network that we have, at an infrastructure level, that there is no reason why you can't really charge your electric car and forgive me, this is a lawyer speaking, I could be completely out of my comfort zone, and my head of electrical here is somewhere, so please shout, Rob, if I get this wrong. But there is, in theory, no reason why you can't charge your electric car like you do your toothbrush, with induction charging, with inductive plates, mm, yeah. in the roads as the car is going along, so it's constantly charging. 
And then you get your car, you get it back home, and when you plug it in, you're not charging your car, actually. You're dissipating the energy within that energy storage device back into the energy network, and it becomes a nebulous and interesting relationship of energy rather than just a car as we know it. I think that, that, I mean, that was a, a crucially important point, that, that if, uh, I think as you get sucked into the world of electric vehicles, you realise they're not electric vehicles. They are batteries, they are electricity storage systems on wheels that can be transported around. That, they, that uh, a lot of the studies about, the, you know, if we had 20 million electric cars in this country, how many more power stations would we need? No, less. We'd need to generate less power because we're using that power that we have now. The reason we have a lot of power stations now is because our consumption goes like that and like that. And that is incredibly difficult and expensive to manage because when it's like that, we've got to turn everything on. And that means dirty, imported, mm. expensive. Mm. When it's like that, we're going, what the hell are we doing with this? Turn it all off, which is incredibly expensive and complicated. And if you've got electric cars, and we're talking millions of them, what you might end up with is a, a, a usage like that because the the, the batteries can dump power into the grid when there's high demand and they can take it when there's low demand. Mm. And that is an extraordinary thing. I'm having an, a, a vehicle to grid unit fitted in my house in October. I don't know what difference that's going to make at the moment. It's still early technology. How will it affect my electricity use? How much of that electricity would I be prepared to sell to the grid, which I can now do? Do I just want to go, why don't I just empty the battery and get a couple of pence? You know, I think probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it makes... But, you know, that sort, those, those steps, it, it, we, we, it's very easy if you've never driven one to think, oh, I have to stop and plug it in and wait while it charges. I have never waited for an electric car to charge. I do something useful while it's plugged in. Sleep, eat, <laughs> flirt with my wife pointlessly. <laughs> you know, there's many activities. <laughs> But you know, so that, uh, that so you're not, uh, you don't, you don't wait while the car charges. Everybody, because that's what you do with a petrol car. You've got to stand out in the cold, holding a pump with toxic fumes that you're breathing in. I can't do that anymore. It's horrible. I don't waste my time standing by a car while it fills up. What a waste of time. I plug it in and go and do something more interesting. And it is that thing. You just go, oh, I've got to wait. I'll be on a long journey and I'll have to wait. No, go and have a nice cup of coffee and a wee and read a book. And stretch and walk. It's really bad for you to sit in a car for five hours at a time. Whenever else do you do that? You know, you, you need to move around. So, and I always say, forget battery range. Don't worry about it. Bladder range. Find out what your bladder <laughs> range is. Yeah. Work out what your bladder range is. Young people, it's much longer. Gentlemen of a certain age, it gets slightly shorter. I'm 100, 165 miles, 200 kilometers. I can do, boom, I can bash it out the park. Then I have to stop. Doesn't matter what the car's doing. I think, damn, I was, did swear to myself that I wouldn't mention bladder range uh, in such an august institution. <laughs> and, and I've done it right at the end. It is 8.30. We, are, we have to ra wind up now. And, uh, uh, I, think, is that, I think that's correct, isn't it, roughly? Uh, I think we could, I'd, I'd love to stay here for another hour and gas on and hear more questions. I know you've got more questions, but I think we're meant to, to wind it up. So thank you so much for coming along tonight. Thank you very much to the panel. Please thank uh, Christian, Richard and Alison. Thank you very much.